Hello, keyboard friends, and keyboard family, and keyboard doggos. Today we're going to go through the Helix Lab Aru, which is a TKL aluminum custom uh, being sold currently by Helix Lab. Now it's available in quite a few colors. Now I've got the black version here, but it comes in white, green, pink, gold, and sand. Oh boy, I love sand. Uh, there's a few options in terms of PCB, or two options. You can either go uh, hot swap or you can go with a soldered PCB. Now I've got the soldered variant here as well. And uh, you can also go win key or win keyless, which uh, cool. Uh, it comes with a few plate options, uh, 1.5 millimeter and also four millimeter plates. I've got the 1.5 millimeter here and I generally advise against getting a four millimeter plate unless you really know what you're doing. It's a very unique design that's got a whole bunch of engraving alongside the entire top side, which I personally think looks fantastic. And it's got a triangle weight. And yes, get it all out in the comments. Triangle man give good review to triangle keyboard shocked face eggplant emoji. But yeah. Uh, this is currently in group buy. So this is the uh, the first ever keyboard in-depth review for a keyboard that you can still purchase right now. Uh, do I recommend this keyboard? Yes. This keyboard is expensive. It's about 470 to 480 US dollars starting price. And uh, that's a little on the high end. Now I'll go through why I like this particular keyboard and you can make your own decisions for yourself. All right? All right. So. First things first, we're going to go through the, the thing I hate the most, the unboxing experience. Let's see what the experience is like of unboxing this. And then we'll actually look at the thing that matters, which is the keyboard itself. Alrighty, here we are with the unboxing experience. I'm not the biggest fan of unboxing experiences. However, this is one of the first keyboards where I kind of enjoy the unboxing experience for a very particular reason. Now, first things first, it's a black box. This one isn't perfectly sealed for reasons. And it's got some cool drawings on it. It's the same as this desk mat, exactly the same. Uh, so if you really, really like the design here, consider the desk mat. A lot of people really like the desk mat. For me, eh, it's okay. We're not here to review the desk mat. It's a simple cardboard box. And as we open it, obviously I've already assembled my unit, so it's gonna be different. Here we are. Now the first thing you'll see when you open it is obviously the plate PCB, which we've got installed into the unit. And obviously you've got the foam and we have very strong feelings about foam. All right, pretty cool. And then once you get here, uh, essentially there's a little piece of foam that goes inside the 60% area of the keyboard, right? Like so. And it houses a few things. It houses the weight, which we've got installed, and it houses any, uh, any uh, artisans that you may have purchased. Pretty neat. It also houses this. But Simon, what is this? Hmm? This is a SD card and a micro SD card reader. So SD cards go in here, micro SDs go in here. And if we look right here, we can see Helix Lab, eight gigabytes. Now what's on here? I expected this to be, you know, some lovely Chinese ransomware, but it turns out uh, this is the QMK firmware, the VIA firmware, uh, the uh, the user manual, as well as some desktop wallpapers. Pretty cool. Very helpful. Uh, now I have an SD card reader that looks pretty darn cool. It's got the Helix branding on it. Nice. Very nice. Now, uh, alongside this, I like how this fits right into the keyboard. Essentially, this takes up very, very little space and gives me... It's, it's so nice because the box is so small. The box fits the keyboard perfectly. 
and also fits all of the accessories. Now, once we've pulled the weight out and we've pulled our artisan caps out and we've pulled our uh, SD card reader out, we finally see the board, which generally is not built at the time. Uh, in addition to this, we get all of our screw bags. What I love about the screw bags is they're branded, they tell you the size, and they tell you what they're for. That is amazing attention to detail. I love that. For, for big idiots like me, I need you to tell me which hole I put it in because like, I, I don't know. I don't know where it goes. So pretty cool. So these are generally like over here when you first open the box. And then your micro SD card is in here, which is somewhere in the box. And then you finally get to pull it out, if you know what I mean. We've got some foam here on the bottom that exists to protect the keyboard during shipping. And you just pull it out. It's fantastic. It is fantastic. Now, disclosure time. Uh, this keyboard was sent to me as a review unit, and I had the option of keeping it for free, but I will not be doing that. I will be purchasing a production unit. Uh, I have enjoyed this so much that I will be purchasing a production unit, and we will go through why, and we will start with the case externals. Alrighty, here's the good stuff. Look at that. Look how gorgeous that is. Now, obviously in all my reviews, I try to stay as unbiased as possible. <clears throat> so let me just get all my bias out. All at the beginning. God, this is so nice. Oh, the engravings. I'm such a sucker for engravings. I love engravings. It's so good. It's just, ooh, just, oh, so engraved. So nice. And then obviously, we've got the triangle. The triangle, the triangle. Don't mind my sweat, don't worry about it. Oh, so good, it's so good. All right, bias is out of the way, let's go. So, <clears throat> first things first, obviously we can see here a couple things. Uh, first of all, this may look like a brass plate, but this is actually an aluminum plate that has been anodized to look like it's brass. Uh, honestly, I prefer that over a brass plate. Uh, alu plate has a little bit more uh, more flex to it. Although a brass plate can deform more, a aluminum plate will actually return to its original position after being deformed, unlike brass. Uh, I mean, we'll start we'll start at the top and work our way down. So obviously we've got all of these engravings. Now, all of this is CNC'd. So each of these is just CNC'd. All of this is CNC'd. And the precision and the quality control is pretty damn good. Look at that, look at that. We'll get it up on the macro cam so you guys can see the uh, level of detail. Let me zoom it out. Alrighty, let's go. Macro time. So take a look at that. Take a look at that. Isn't that, isn't that fantastic? Let's get a little bit closer. If I can. All right. Oh. Here we are. Look at that. So it's all CNC, it's all anodized on top of the CNC. Now, generally the, uh, the things that I would be looking for in terms of problems is uh, considering, you know, the angles of this. So these come up basically straight up. So what I would be looking for is some discoloration, uh, some white colors uh, near the edges of each shape, but I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing that at all. And that's a very good indicator of just a very well done anodization. And I'm a big fan of that. Uh, looking at the top, you may not be able to notice this, but uh, this is a non-standard spacing. It's uh, a very non-standard keyboard. And at first glance, it kind of looks normal, but there's two things to keep in mind. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is the USB port is over here. It's on the left, not the right. So that's a uh, 87B 
uh, USB placement instead of an 87A USB placement. Uh, the second thing is this function row may look a little bit strange to you because it is. Uh, if I were to grab, we'll grab this. This is the plate for the Geonworks F1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to align these cutouts with the bottom row. Here we are. Uh, okay. So near the bottom, we can see that the switches basically all fit perfectly in there. But once we get to the function row, we see that the function row on this keyboard sits a little bit higher than it should by a tiny, tiny amount. It's like one or two millimeters, but it will throw you off. It will 100% throw you off. This also means that it's not compatible with standard uh, 87B PCBs. Uh, as for the spacing of the nav cluster, We've basically got the same thing going on here. You may not be able to see on camera, but uh, all of these are shifted to the right a little bit. So everywhere there's a gap. So that's the gap between the 60% and the nav cluster and the gap between the 60% and the F row are all slightly larger than normal. Generally, I don't have a problem with this except for the fact that you really don't have access to aftermarket PCBs that will fit this. Now, we'll talk about the PCB later, but uh, in this case, I'm giving this keyboard a pass for a very specific reason that has to do with the PCB. All right. Uh, obviously, you guys can see the engraving. It's very cool. It's themed off, you know, uh, OG Egyptian hieroglyphs and stuff. Let's take a look at our corners. Very important. All right, here we are. So the the top is actually very flat. There's uh, there's there's no f there's no uh, oh god the two words I always forget. There's no fillet and there's no uh, the other one. We're actually gonna sit here until I remember. Magnets, how do they work? All right, let's pause the video until I remember. Two hours later. All right, we got it. It's chamfer. I literally had to Google it again. Oh uh, my God, I am literally the worst. Welcome to the worst keyboard channel on YouTube, by the way. All right, so my point was there's uh, no chamfer and there's no fillet up top. So it's very, very flat. There's a small little angle here, but it, like you guys are on a macro cam and you can't even see it. It's very, 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 very minor just to aid in the uh, in the finishing. Uh, because if you have perfectly 90 degree edges, the finishing process is gonna be a pain in the ass. Uh, speaking of which, we can see that the anodization all through the edges is very clean. If you see any little white marks, that's just, that's just dust. So very clean, very nice. Uh, overall, our our overall design is rounded in terms of the corners. All the corners here are rounded. The internal uh, the internal corners are also rounded. Obviously, a lot more aggressively, but we can see the internal radii here relatively clean. It looks like they're using the same radius pretty much everywhere through the board on the internals. And the externals is a nice, big, rounded corner, which I like. I like. Uh, aesthetically, this is pretty fantastic. Uh, as soon as your brain adjusts to the uh, increased spacing of the EFRO and the increased uh, spacing of the navigation cluster. All right. Now, the anodization matching is good. Like most black anodiz uh, anodization, it kind of is a fingerprint magnet, especially if you have terrible, terrible sweaty hands like I do. Uh, the matching is actually quite good. What we've got here is a reflectivity mismatch because uh, the main light is over there and this side is dark. So the anno is behaving as it should. Uh, it looks like there's a little bit of discoloration closer to the seam on the top side, but in person, not really. 
Not really. So the anodization uh, matching is pretty good. And in terms of the anodization consistency, again, please mind my fingerprints. Uh, the anodization consistency in person is good. It's not the best I've ever seen. Um, I've been kind of spoiled by anodization. We can see some general grain everywhere. Now, I have wiped this down multiple times just to try and get my fingerprints out of it. But what you are seeing here, a lot of streaks, that's my own fingerprints and uh, just some residue of uh, the cleaning products I used. Overall, though, the black anodization is a little bit grainy, and that's not an anodization problem. That's a uh, source aluminum, uh, like, purity and consistency thing. And there's no perfect aluminum unless you, you know, get some super, super crazy expensive stuff. Uh, in terms of a black anno, this is a solid 8 out of 10. In terms of the matching, the matching is 10 out of 10. And then uh, in terms of the anodization, uh, sorry, in terms of the aluminum consistency, it's okay. It's like a 7. All right. So let's, uh, let's tour through the design before we get into the internals. Now... The top is perfectly flat. The bottom makes the angle. This is a classic seamed design where we can physically see the seam. Uh, the leg or the foot is fairly standard OG style, uh, reminiscent of tons of keyboards, essentially. So this isn't something that's never been done before. And then once we turn to the back, we start seeing some more interesting stuff. Uh, this right here is a piece of acrylic, which exists for one purpose. And that purpose is RGB. Uh, if I were to turn off my lights, one moment, or at least one of my lights. There we go. It is incredibly, incredibly bright, especially in the dark. Uh, here with all of my video lights on, it's not super apparent, but for reference, when this is on my desk and I leave it plugged in overnight, it lights up the back wall, which for me, I'm not the biggest fan of, but for some people that, I don't know, I guess they really like stuff like that. So we've got a back piece here. This is a piece of aluminum. Now, uh, before the case is fully assembled, this has a little bit of play. Uh, so I assume it's being held in place by the plate mounting, which we will discuss once we get in there. And then there is a, uh, a little drop-in piece for the USB port. Uh, I kind of like this because it kind of protects this from getting scratched. The downside to uh, this little piece here, which is my only gripe with the exterior, is that this has a little bit of play. You guys see that? which also means it makes noise here. And that's just the sound of it moving around just a tiny, tiny little bit. Like you can't even tell. Uh, in a real use case, this doesn't matter at all. Uh, this is a prototype unit, obviously. Maybe the production units will fix it, but this is a very, very simple fix where you throw a piece of tape on the inside and your problems are solved. Uh, here we've got some more engraving. Here it says Aru, which is obviously the name of the keyboard. right? And once we drop down to the bottom, we see this pretty cool weight. Now the weight has some engraving around it. That's a little crescent, that's more than a mid-moon. I don't know the names of the moon phases, and that's a like, full moon. Got engravings all the way around. The depth of the engravings is not super deep, but it's deep enough to see what they are. And then we've got this brass weight right here, which uh, I still can't figure out what specifically the coating is. Uh, in terms of texture, uh, it feels like ceramic paint, though I'm not sure. Look at that. It's very, very cleanly done. Uh, I don't see any machining marks. 
I don't see any issues. Uh, I know this is brass simply from its weight, and I love the coating on it because I have an issue with brass where I live, uh, which is the brass will become brown and blue within like a couple weeks of use because of the high humidity. Uh, this is something I'd actually love to catch on the macro cam. All right, here we are. Look at that. That There's a great amount of detail here. There's a great amount of detail. So this is the deepest point, and then it rises up here, and then the entire eye bulges out. In terms of, in terms of machining, this is very, very cleanly machined, and I really, really enjoy the finishing on it. I think it looks super, super cool. Now this is a through weight, so uh, this weight is installed from the interior, or screwed in from the interior. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's about this big. Uh, that affects acoustics, obviously. If you go with a uh, wider weight, you tend to deepen the sound of your keyboard, while a smaller weight will sound a little bit more higher pitched than you know, a full through bar weight, essentially. Uh, here we've got uh, some locations for feed. These are standard 12 millimeter bump ons that I do not have installed for <clears throat> reasons. The reason being, I don't have any. And we've got, uh, oh God, math. We have seven case screws. So four on the bottom, three on the top. And these are very, very nice screws. All right, let's see if we've missed anything before we get into the case internals. I think that's pretty much it. I think that is pretty much it. All right, let's uh, disassemble this and get into the internal case. Alrighty, on to what many people consider the most important part of the in-depth review series. We've got the screw review. Now in terms of screws, I really, really like these. So there's two lengths. You've got the long ones for the back. Very cool. And then we've got the four short ones, which are out of frame. The, short, the four short ones for the front side of the keyboard. I really prefer this to using just uh, the same length screw everywhere and then having to essentially drill deeper into the case, which then may cause uh, uh, issues trying to get you know a thick headed screwdriver in there and end up stripping all of your anodization when you're trying to unscrew uh, the back side of the case, whereas the front is totally fine. Uh, all of this can be solved just by using longer screws in the back, shorter screws in the front. Now these screws are gold plated and generally uh, what I'm looking for for quality control is looking uh, at the tips of the screws to try and see if I can see any black residue from the uh, screw tap process. It's incredibly clean. These are incredibly clean screws, which means uh, not only are the screws brand new, but the, uh, the screw taps of the keyboard have been cleaned during the quality control process. Uh, if you can or can or cannot tell, these screws are actually knurled. So that means you've got little ribbing here where you can like grab onto it with your fingers to turn it kind of like uh, the case screws from like your computer case. This is not at all necessary for a keyboard and actually might be detrimental more than beneficial, but I really like it. So, so those are the screws or at least the case screws. Now, when I went through the unboxing process, which I have yet to shoot, I'm shooting it after this. Uh, when I go through the unboxing process, uh, all of these actually just like come in dedicated little baggies and each, each baggie tells you how many screws are in there and which tool you should be using, which is amazing. It's the, the, little, the little things is what makes or breaks a keyboard, especially these days, because we've gotten to the point where obviously like keyboards have hit an upper limit so people like me and you know other people in the hobby that are into like higher end mechs and whatnot we've gotten a lot more picky and a lot more bitchy and it's the little things that matter now and one of those things is obviously just 
put the screws in bags, tell me which screws they are in case I have to buy replacements so I don't have to send a DM to some guy I've never met and be like, hey dude, I need replacement screws, what size? Nope, not necessary. It's literally written right there. Look at that. That's fantastic. All right, let us disassemble this baby. Come on, come on, come apart. All right, I'm gonna flip it, one moment. All right, there we go. We'll go through the case bottom first, and then we'll go through the case top. Now, here it is, here's the uh, through weight that we discussed earlier. This is a little bright, let me turn down that light, there we go. So this is the through weight, it is a large square on this side and a large triangle on the other side. This is of course a prototype. I assume there will be some slight changes, but I think the prototype that I have is very, very, very close to the production series. Around the sides we can see there's various levels of ledges, which is quite interesting. Now this ledge right here alongside this, 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 and this are to accommodate these crews or the space for the screws uh, that mount the plate to the top case, right? Now it says here, designed by Helix Lab, established 2020, very cool. Uh, as their first board, I kind of really like it. They're doing a lot of cool stuff, doing a lot of really cool stuff. All right, this is the little acrylic panel that comes out the back right here. So that means the lights shine into here and then are refracted 90 degrees. And this is the back piece. So I assume this allows you to have multiple back pieces so you can pick whatever color you want. It's pretty cool. Uh, I'd like to also assume that hopefully sometime in the future that this back piece can be alternative materials if you want to go, you know, uh, tempered steel or titanium or something of the sort. Pretty cool. Uh, all of these are using the same exact screw. Yeah, which is one step smaller than the case screw, which is pretty cool. And here we've got the little, the little thing that protects the port. So this piece right here. So that is, uh, that is kept in place by this large piece right here. Now, I was talking about earlier how this could be solved with a piece of tape, because you got some movement here. Uh, you can literally just put a piece of tape between the black part and this part. As long as it's a thin piece of tape, it won't really conflict with, uh, with any, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? With any alignment. All right, that's pretty much it. Uh, in terms of the case internals, the uh, quality of the anodization on the inside is actually as good as the quality of the anodization on the outside. It's pretty good. Obviously, my fingerprints are everywhere. If you have very sweaty hands, black is probably not the board color for you. But, you know, I really, really like this in black. Uh, one additional thing that I have yet to figure out is if we look here, we can see small little tabs. Never seen this on a board before. So right here and right here. This tiny, I'm not gonna be able to focus on this because the camera is gonna try and be a smart ass, but just tiny little things in there. Here, let me show you. Let me get something small I can put in there like this. All right, so check this out. I can actually go in here. So that's in, out, in, out. So it's a small little, small little place right here where apparently you can put something. I don't know what the something is. It makes no sense to me. Uh, it might have something to do with the foam, which I don't use foam in any of my builds because why would I silence a build? So yeah, pretty cool. Uh, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of the alignment of the top and bottom case, we don't really see any alignment pillars here. So generally we'd see uh, pillars here that would align the top to the bottom. Those pillars are actually on the top side and they land on this little ledge right here, if you guys can see that ledge. So there's ledges here and here where the top case has 
the alignment tabs there. So it allows it to just, bam, it slots right into place. All right, so that is the bottom. Let's talk about the top. Let us talk about the top. First of all, yes, the PCB looks very cool, but we're not gonna talk about that. We are going to take apart the top or remove the plate from the top to get an idea of what is going on. Now, the very astute amongst you can tell that there are only two mounting points on the back of the plate. So this is the front of the keyboard, this is the back of the keyboard. There's only two screws here. And then the logical question that everybody asked, including me, was, hey, how does this affect typing feel? Realistically, not at all. Uh, I will show you, once I reassemble it, how much movement you can get out of it if you press really, really hard. But through normal usage, it's not something you really notice. Or it's not something you notice at all, to be fair. All right, let's pull this out. Okie dokie. So we're gonna take a look at the top. The top is very, very simple. We've got the alignment tab, essentially, that just goes the entirety of the way around the top case. And then there is empty space here for the bottom side. So the top and the bottom, they make a nice little, nice little hugging motion where they touch each other. <clears throat> appropriately with full consent and then uh, align the case very well. So we've got the four mounting points here for the uh, for the front of the plate, which uh, e. again, not a huge fan of this. And we've got two mounting points at the top. So far, nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, the top piece is decently heavy for what it is, but otherwise looks fairly standard in every way. We've got our screw holes for the case screws, which are the one, two, three right there, and then the one, two, three, four down here. I see a very, very similar thingy here. So I think these were actually used as the hook points during the anodization process. So when, uh, I mean, for those of you that don't know, in order to put a piece of aluminum into an, uh, in, into an anodizing bath, you have to hang it by something. Uh, once you hang it by something, the points at which that something touches your piece of aluminum is, is not going to get anodized as well as you know the other pieces, which is why sometimes you see uh, little bits of raw, so unanodized aluminum near the screw holes, because most manufacturers will just hang a keyboard by the holes in it, because that's what makes sense. These actually look like the hook points. So they're nicely hidden in there and probably never gonna get it to focus, but I'll try. So little hook points in here and here. And if I were to demonstrate how this would work is I can grab it by the hook points. There we go. And just submerge it into there without making contact with any part of the top case or the bottom case. So this actually explains what those little points are for. The fact that they're on, uh, that there's two on every side is kind of suspicious because you only need one, but this might be built for the specific hardware that they have during the anodizing process. Otherwise, fairly simple. We can see a large cutout here. That's where the, uh, the, the back piece, which uh, on my unit is the gold piece, uh, sits and hides the seam between the top and the bottom. Pretty cool. Pretty darn cool. Okie dokie. So that's it. That's it for the top. Nothing super fancy here. It's all fairly simple. Let's get into the plate and PCB. We'll do the plate first. Now, there are multiple plate variants. Uh, this particular plate is an aluminum plate that is uh, anodized to look like a brass plate. Okay. No complaints. Uh, Obviously, we've got the mounting points, which a lot of people are gonna notice there's some problems here. Now, there's only two mount points up top, and again, this doesn't affect the feel at all. 
my issue with the mount points is there is a mount point right here, right next to the spacebar. I'm not the biggest fan of this, and I would have preferred if this particular mount point was not there at all. Now, hey Simon, why do we not like a mount point next to our spacebar? There's a lot of psychological effects while typing. One of those effects is if your spacebar feels very, very stiff, then the rest of your board kind of feels stiff as well, because it's the most common key you'll press. By removing the mounting points from the spacebar landing area and making sure your mount points are outside the spacebar landing area, it allows you to feel just a little bit more flex when you slap that spacebar really hard and overall makes your board seem more flexy than it actually is. Uh, all right, I guess we'll we'll start we'll start at the bottom of the plate and we'll uh, we'll work our way towards the top. So the uh, <clears throat> the bottom row is not fixed. So this particular unit is uh, win keyless bottom row, but it has win keys obviously. So 1.51, 1.57, 1.51, 1.5. Uh, you can also do uh, the standard 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, .25, and then go to the 6.25. Anyway. It offers you a little bit of uh, 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 it offers you a little bit of flexibility, but not the large amount of flexibility where there's just a big freaking hole here, like TX boards. You know what TX uh, boards look like? Their bottom row, like this entire portion, is just cut out. That's not a good thing because you may have issues with switch alignment if your switches do not have PCB mount uh, pins. So that means you're relying on your plate entirely to make sure that all of your switches are straight, and if there's no plate there then your switches are not going to be straight. In this case, pretty darn good. Uh, we've got a acoustic cutout area near the spacebar. I like this personally. Uh, some people don't like it. The, the, the actual sonic difference is very, very, very small, and it completely depends on the entirety of the board, what kind of sound changes it makes. Obviously, it opens up the sound. It allows sound to hit the PCB instead of hit the plate and then rebound back up, which sounds a little bit different depending on what plate you have versus what the PCB sounds like. Uh, we've got a small little badge here that says Aru. That's CNC'd on. Pretty cool. So that leads me to believe this is a full CNC plate. So uh, not, you know, laser cut or water cut or any of the 80,000 other ways of making plates. So full CNC plate. Uh, we've got our flex cuts here. Uh, a lot of people think these are for acoustics. They're not. This is actually for flex. When you see cuts that span the entirety of the board, these exist to allow uh, the board to flex in uh, this axis, essentially. So it allows me to press down on the center and have the center depress lower than it generally should. Uh, Flex cut here is just a throwback to like the, the original OTD flex cuts. This realistically doesn't do much, uh, especially if you've got, you know, multiple mount points. Uh, if we were, for example, doing like three mount points on the bottom, maybe two up top, we could get a little bit of flex, uh, a little bit more flex here on the edges uh, due to this. But with this particular plate and mounting combo, not so much. Uh, we've got the OG cutout where the old school full size uh, controller would be on OTDs. So this is a very OTD-esque plate in a lot of ways. Obviously, it's not exactly the same, but it's a lot of throwbacks. Uh, here we've got an acoustic cutout here, here, and here. Now, uh, oh, also here, pardon. Uh, these are put around stabilized keys. Uh, many people think they you know, reduce the pitch, but actually they raise the pitch. So, uh, so they make your stabilized keys sound a little bit higher pitch than they did before. That's something you kind of want because they generally sound deeper. And the general idea of a sound of a board is you want it to sound consistent. You want your modifiers to sound closer to your alphas than, you know, whatever weird Narnian sounds they sound like. And uh, let's see, that's pretty much it. These are acoustic cuts right here. This is just a meme cut. There's no point in having that cut there. Uh, a lot of these are meme cuts, like this, 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 meme cut, that in there is a meme cut. Uh, that's a meme cut. Uh, realistically, this isn't really necessary, but eh, it's fine. 
Overall, I like the plate, this particular aluminum plate. It's, uh, it's, very, uh, it's very light and very thin, which is a good thing. Uh, you want a light aluminum plate. You want the typing experience on an aluminum plate to be uh, crisp, uh, not stiff, not harsh, a little bit of flex, but you know, not, we're not talking polycarbonate flex or flex like that. We're just talking some nice 1.5 millimeter aluminum flex. Uh, this is a relatively, uh, relatively stiff aluminum though. Uh, I think this might be seven series. I can tell you it's not five series aluminum. So it's either a uh, high six series or seven series or a high temper. Uh, that's a good thing, obviously. We, that is what we are trying to get out of an aluminum plate. The only time we would go with a five series aluminum plate is if you're trying to get, uh, you're trying to get you know, leaf springs like this, where you really, really need the flex. But here, you kind of want it to be more stiff. So yeah, all right, that's the plate. And let's move on to the PCB. The PCB is pretty freaking cool. Now, the design aesthetics are very Wilba-esque to the point where <clears throat> it's a little too Wilba-esque, uh, but it is pretty darn cool. The traces are in red. The traces on the back of the board all go horizontal, uh, whereas the traces on the other side all go vertical. Uh, that's a fairly standard thing. Uh, we can see the major paths of the traces, obviously coming off the controller, which I believe is a 32U4. It is not. It is a 90U, and I assume it is a 90U because of the amount of the uh, the amount of RGB we have on it. Anyway, we'll go we'll go through it step by step. Again, we'll start at the bottom. We'll work our way to the top. Now here we've got a little helix badge. This looks like it's done in copper. Looks pretty good. Let's zoom in on that. Let's get this out of the way. Right there. Obviously this is black as well, so every time I've touched it, I've completely ruined it and stained it as is customary. Right here it says PCB designed by Helix Lab, powered by QMK firmware. Yep, this has QMK, and uh, it came with VIA firmware as well, which, thank the Lord, it came with VIA. Uh, my first issue when I pulled this board out of its box was, first, I saw the USB port was on the wrong side. Normally, your USB port is here near your nav cluster and your arrows. So I saw it over here, and then I noticed that the uh, function row gap was non-standard. To which I'm just like, okay, that means I can never get a replacement PCB for this. That's gonna have VIA on it. I'm gonna be stuck on some terrible Chinese firmware. Nope, joke's on me. It actually came with QMK. It came with uh, QMK VIA, it came with a user's manual, it came with a whole bunch of stuff which uh, I went through, or will go through, during the unboxing process. So, pretty darn cool. So. The traces here are in red. I don't know if these are the actual traces or if it's just silk screened on top of the traces. I'm not a big PCB guy. I'm not sure. All I know is the PCB thus far has been good. Uh, what I would have liked to see is obviously uh, uh, <clears throat> little uh, little tags telling me 1.5 is here, 1.25 is here, uh, 7U is here, 6.25U is here as well as generally the names of the keys, A, S, D, F, just in case. It's, it's very convenient for people that are not great at soldering. It's very convenient for people that like don't know off the top of their head which one is the step caps lock, which one is the standard caps lock. Oh no, how do I do my bottom row? Oh shit, one of, one of my key caps isn't working and it's F, which one is F? So it's, it's very helpful. If you're doing this much work on the back, at, at the very least, uh, you want to indicate your bottom row at the very least. If you're not gonna mark every key, at least indicate the bottom row so people don't put in their switches in the wrong spots and then fully assemble their keyboards and then realize, ah, oh, no, I've, my, you know, my Windows key is slightly to the left. All right, otherwise looks fairly good. I mean, again, I'm not a big PCB guy, but the diodes are fairly standard. 
very small. Uh, they're all securely attached, which for a Chinese PCB <clears throat> designed QC made in China is a big plus. This is one of the nicer, proper Chinese PCBs that I've seen. Uh, Chinese PCBs are known for one thing, and that one thing is these diodes are, they'll just nope out of there. They will nope out of there and you will never find them again. But they're pretty good. Uh, we have uh, LED compatib uh, uh, compatibility for every single switch with the exception of the caps lock and the scroll lock, which actually have surface mount RGBs, which is really, really, really cool. That means from the top side, uh, obviously you're not going to see it on these switches, but right under here and right under here are RGB LEDs that can be used as indicators. Now, I have no idea how to enable those on VIA because I am large stupid, but it's very, very cool. And then obviously we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15 LEDs on the bottom, which again, do not look super spectacular here on camera because of all the lighting that I have, but I assure you, these will blind you. Hello? Yeah, and your neighbors. It is super bright. It is super, super bright. It's pretty darn bright. So overall, the PCB is pretty darn good. Now, generally what people are trying to get a look at is, there we go, this area right here where we have our USB coming in. Generally what people are looking for is the circuitry for uh, ESD protection and all of that. I, I cannot, tell if it's there or not. I can recognize very, very few things. One of these days I'm going to learn how to properly PCB. Like I know that's the clock. That's pretty much all I know. And that's the controller. It's pretty well done. It's clean. It's pretty looking. Uh, for reference, this is the chip. Come on. Pretty neat. Nothing crazy. Nothing crazy at all. Okie dokie. Now, uh, when I originally assembled this the first time, these screws the that hold the plate on have little gaskets. And these came uh, like in the same bag as the screws. Uh, as I assembled this the first time on stream, uh, the Helix, essentially, the guy in charge of Helix Lab, uh, told me to put these on because I had originally assembled it without these because when I do my builds, I put in no foam, no gaskets, none of that nonsense. I want to see what the board is meant to feel and sound like, not what you know people can do to change it. Uh, so apparently these are necessary in order to space the plate adequately, apparently. I have no idea how it works, but apparently it is a requirement during assembly. Now I'm going to assemble this back together super quickly and show you uh, show you how much movement there is on the back side of the plate. Okie dokie. All right, so obvious point was that there is no mounting on the plate between this point and this point. So this is all essentially empty. Now, realistically, while typing on it, the plate does not move. Now that's my entire desk bouncing up and down. The plate does not move. And I'm, I'm hitting this hard. Now, in terms of how much actual flex, if I push super, super hard, that's how much movement I can get out of it. This is putting down maybe like eight kilos of pressure. 
Like my whole desk is shaking. So it's not much movement, but there is movement. Uh, this movement doesn't really have any real world effect at all. The, the one thing that it does affect is obviously the sound profile of each row, but there is no keyboard where the top row and the function row and the bottom row and the center alpha sound exactly the same. Keyboards work in particular ways. And uh, I mean, I, I had somebody reach out to me and tell me, hey, Simon, my, my F row sounds different than my number. I'm like, yeah, it's a keyboard. <laughs> That's what keyboards are supposed to sound like. Uh, it's incredibly hard to make a very uniform sounding board. Now, before we get into my summary, this is the part of the video where I go through my tips and tricks for, for building it and tuning it and all that good stuff. Now, uh, somewhere in my room is the foam that came with this. Uh, they give you a piece of foam that goes between the plate and the PCB. Do not use this piece of foam unless you're going for a very silent build. So that means uh, silent switches, non-clipped stabs, uh, band-aid modded stabs, uh, very quiet caps on a desk mat like like if if you need to like you know break into the kgb headquarters and type very quietly that kind of keyboard otherwise the foam is not necessary now the uh case as a whole is rather boomy now i built this with i built this with clickies and a lot of people have told me hey simon why did you build it with clickies it's very hard to hear the sound of the board not at all you've got the sound of the switch and you've got the sound of the board. They're very different sounds. As long as you can mentally figure out which is which, it's not a major problem. The reason why I went with clicky switches on this board is I think this is a really, really good candidate for clicky switches. Back in the day, in you know, the old, old times, when OTD was around, there were keyboards being built specifically for clickies and then specifically for tactiles or linears because there are uh, there are internal sound profiles of keyboards that will make clicky sound better or linear sound quieter or all of that. Now, this is a rather boomy keyboard. That doesn't mean it's hollow. It's boomy. Uh, I went with clickies because, in my opinion, a board like this was made for clickies. And in my opinion, it sounds fantastic. My only wish is that like I could have louder clickies and more tactile clickies. So in general, if you're if you're going for a tactile or a linear build, I'd recommend you do pretty much the same thing. No foam. Uh, make sure you lube your switches in order to uh, bring down the pitch of uh, of all of the switches. Uh, if uh, if the keyboard is too loud for your liking, uh, go with thicker uh, PBT caps if possible. Uh, if it's not loud enough, which is in my case, I put DCS caps on it to just bring out more of that lovely switch sound. Uh, obviously, having a desk mat will help you out. Uh, that's pretty much it. I think this is a fantastic board for clickies and probably an okay board for tactiles and linears. Now I listened to some sound tests, but if you've seen my video, you know that sound tests are not really indicative of much. So moving on to my sound tests, and then we'll go through uh, my final summary.
All right, here we are. It's time. It's time for the summary for the Aru. Ooh, ooh. I like it. It's a very, very nice board. I appreciate the small little things, which is all you can realistically look for in you know higher end customs these days. Is you know, it's all about the little things. It's all about the you know paying close attention to the smallest details. And I appreciate that. The, anodiz uh, the anodization and finishing was spectacular. The machining is, I mean, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it, which is why I really like the board. Now, uh, I may have said this before, but I will be purchasing one of these. That's how much I enjoy it. Now, the price point starts at like $470 for a very high MOQ. And they're making like 2,000 of these boards. Now, I understand that the top machining is expensive to do, and it adds it adds some machining time. How much? I don't know. It really, really depends on what type of prices they're getting, if they own their own machines, et cetera, et cetera. But I still think at $470, it is a wee bit expensive. I don't think it's overpriced. And if I did, I wouldn't be purchasing one, but I think it's a wee bit expensive. It's all about the aesthetics. Uh, this board has some aesthetics that you will either love or you will hate. And if you love these aesthetics, then you should definitely consider picking up this board. If you hate the aesthetics, then obviously <laughs> don't buy the board. But it's nice. The unboxing experience is nice. The typing experience is nice. The sound is nice. That's pretty much everything. Like as a whole, the three pillars of keyboard, which is aesthetics, 10 out of 10 in my opinion, because I, I love engravings. So it's perfect. And I love triangles, as you can see. So it's perfect. And then the sound for me, especially uh, building it with, uh, with uh, the clickies that I built it with, oh, it was so good. It's a board that I wish I could use more often. I wish I could use it 24 hours a day. I wish I could use it at the office. I wish I could use it everywhere without getting yelled at. And then uh, from a field perspective, it's an aluminum plate. It feels like a keyboard with an aluminum plate. The plate is good. It doesn't have weird flex in weird areas. It's pretty solid. I like it. I like it thoroughly. Uh, I don't know what more to say about this. Uh, I'll, I'm obviously going to put the link into the group buy, which I think is still running. So this is going to be the first board that I'm reviewing while it's still in group buy. So I personally love this. Uh, it's a great board. I'm not getting anything for free. I'm buying my own unit just like you guys, and I think it's great. And I think you should definitely consider the board as well. Anyway, that's my review. Catch you guys on the next one. If you like this video, give me a thumb. And if you like keyboard content, drop a sub. Uh, consider buying one of my eggplant shirts to support me because we don't have sponsors and we don't take free stuff. See you guys on the next one. And why? Nee, minty putu putu, nee.